Hi, thank you. Yeah, so this is work with um, uh, Nikki Vazu. So uh, we've already sort of seen how Liquid Haskell works. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. I wanna start by giving my sort of high level perspective on Liquid Haskell and sort of the way that I think about it. So this is a picture of American bowling. I don't know if, if people are familiar with this. The idea is like you have a, you have a sort of a big bowling ball, bigger than the, the English bowling, uh, and you wanna knock down those 10 pins in the back. Uh, that's sort of your success metric, the number of them that you knock down, that's how you get scored. Um, and then there's these things on the side that are sort of gutters. And these gutters are sort of a failure mode, right? If you, if you don't get it down this like slick wooden path, then your ball just doesn't hit any pins, it just goes to the side. This is how bowling works. Uh, so, so, okay, so Haskell is bowling in my metaphor, like bowling itself, that's Haskell programming. And liquid Haskell is gutter bumpers, which is what you can kind of see in this uh, grainy picture. Let's see. See, these, this, this keeps your ball out of the gutter. Now, uh, an adult bowler would be ashamed to use gutter bumpers in American bowling. But for kids, when you're learning how to bowl, you would use, you would use gutter bumpers so they don't get disheartened when their bowling ball just goes into the gutters every time. So what are the gutters that liquid Haskell helps you avoid? That's what it's for. So I would say it helps you avoid partiality. Right, things like head and div, these are classically partial functions. These are early standard failure modes for your program that you want to avoid. But there's like other interesting failure modes that it helps you avoid. Like, you know, maybe you have some complicated data structure, like your red black trees or AVL trees or whatever it is. Uh, and there's some invariant that needs to hold sort of throughout for your code to work right. And that's not going to be checked inherently by the Haskell type system. It's not going to be checked. It's like sort of partial in that same sense, right? You could have messed up. So, uh, so liquid Haskell will check that for you. Uh, and then also, uh, Haskell is notoriously sort of uh, rule rule oriented. Uh, so you might you might like, you want to make sure you're following the law. So you're going to find a monad instance or a, uh, you know a monoid instance or whatever, and you want to know that your code is sort of correct for that. And so Liquid Haskell can help you that prevents you from defining a uh, bad monad. Okay, so how does Liquid Haskell do it? Um, uh, Lee Korgos already showed us sort of the gist of it. I want to give my sort of very very high level perspective. Uh, so you take a partial function like head. So head uh, is partial. It shouldn't be applied to an empty list. That would be bad. Uh, so you write a refinement that says, no, 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 I'm only talking about the not null list. These are the ones I'm talking about. Um, and then uh, when you call head somewhere, you're going to call it with some argument of a different refinement type. right? So foo is some term that's, that we're going to know prop of it. It's going to be list such that prop. And then the heart of liquid Haskell is this subtype check that says, hey, is lists that have property prop a subtype of lists that are not null? Um, okay, so how does it do that? Well, it says, well, is it true that for all lists, prop implies not null? And we can check that using an SMT solver to see, hey, is it possible that prop holds but not, not null? It's, it's like cool for me to use double negation here. Everyone's okay with that. This is, SMT solvers are classical. This is kind of the deal. Okay, so Liquid Haskell does more, more stuff. And like Lake Korgos' talk was definitely related to the issues like these also. Like it's going to do termination checking for you, make sure that the type of head sort of is a, is a sound one, all of that. Uh, but that's not really what I want to talk about. But this is the gist. This is Liquid Haskell. I, I, like, I don't know why I need to introduce it again. Like we're in the Nikki Vazu session of the Haskell Symposium. So like it's called verification, but anyway, here we are. Okay, cool. So this is what we're trying to do. Um, so uh, what are my goals for this talk? So, so I, I think it's very important to set reasonable goals. Um, I'd like to prove these programs equivalent and someone's related to them. So uh, what's happening here? Well, we have a type of naturals uh, and we have two addition functions. One is sort of a classic addition function, add one int. It adds one to an int. Uh, and then there's add one nat and it conditionally adds one to a nat. Uh, so you can see here that's sort of the domain type, add one nat, once a, once a natural. Okay, so you, you can sub in for these, like a specification and an implementation that has sort of weird corner cases, think about that. I just want to keep it very legible here. Okay, so it's not hard at all in Liquid Haskell to prove this lemma. For all naturals, uh, add one nat of n is equal to add one int of n. This is very, this is very straightforward. Um, now, uh, what I want to do in this talk is prove something slightly stronger. I want to prove that these are the same function. Right? If they're the same on all naturals, they ought to be the same function. Uh, because what I want to be able to do is show that their high order uses are going to be the same. This is my motivation. So it's very easy to prove this last lemma fully applied, right? For all list n's, map add one into n's equals map add, excuse, map one nat n's equals map add one int n's by induction on n's. It's sort of a very, very straightforward exercise. It's the sort of thing that you see in like the intro docs for liquid Haskell. Um, and this fully applied proof style is like fine. Um, it gets pretty annoying as you get sort of deeper and deeper into these even just first order structures. You have deeper and deeper things you need to prove and you need to recapitulate it every time, do the whole induction every time. Uh, and I think Haskell programmers will be sort of sympathetic to this and that like there's a whole ecosystem of like very complicated libraries 
to prevent you from having to name or to help you avoid having to name all of your deep, deep uh, first order transformation. So I think people are sympathetic to this goal. But I give this goal because it's the legible one. The moment any of your representations are higher order, you're done. There's like nothing, there's nothing, like, like there's, no, there's no other choice but to prove equalities between functions. Okay, so, so this is the real motivation. It's a little harder to see, but if you think about things like endofunctors as a monoid or uh, you know, the reader monad, like the reader monad laws for monads are higher order equalities. So you need to be able to talk about equalities between functions. But it's maybe easier to think about this simple example I gave. Okay, cool, so let's, let's do it, right? What could be bad? So we take our, we take our program. Uh, and we'll try to prove it. So first we just prove that for all property, for any given natural number, we can show that they're equal. And then just for fundies, let's try, let's try something so stupid you probably didn't even think of it. Let's try just handing it off to SMT and seeing what SMT says. Like you're all thinking something else, which will be on the next slide, like be cool. Uh, but so, okay, let's see, let's see what it does. Um, so that seek is like the question mark that uh, Lee Korgas showed. Uh, and I'll use his proof combinators later, but. Um, so if you give this a look at Haskell, it says, no, uh, I could not show that unit is a subtype of unit where this property holds. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see that for you. Uh, and this is like, this makes sense if you go look at the SMT lib standard. Okay, uh, it's just really not, it's unspecified what equality and functions should be, and solvers do different things. Um, so the, the thing that you expected me to say up front was we say, oh, you just do this, right? You just say functional extensionality, fun next. Right, so th this is the lemma uh, that's, that is sort of, this is a way to understand when functions are equal. So let's, let's piece it apart. You have two functions. One's red, it's called f. One's blue, it's called g. And we're gonna say, if it is the case for any x of type a, their domain type, uh, that they give you the same answer, then they're equal. So you give this purple equality, saying they're the same thing. Functional extension. Okay, cool. So and this actually, you know, great. So some SMT solvers actually support this, like CVC4 has functional extensionality. Uh, Z3 does not. So we just can't count on the SMT solver to do it for us. But okay, that's fine. We'll just do, we'll do it ourselves. So uh, we made some assumptions uh, last time. Let's make some assumptions this time, right? We Kogros did it, I can do it. It's great. Yeah, you can just type this into your look house and make all the assumptions you like. Okay, great. So we have the same stuff before. We have the definitions add one int, add one nat, add one eek, fun next. And now I'm just going to use it. I have to give it, give it the pieces. So you give this to look at Haskell. Haskell says, you bet. This, isn't, this wasn't the goal I said. I wanted to do it in a context. So like, okay, let's prove some more interesting ones so we can do it in the fully applied form. And you'll note all I'm doing is invoking this use of extensionality. All I'm, all I'm doing is saying, hey, we just saw a moment ago that, uh, that these two are equal functions. And that's enough to see that in you know, fully applied, they're equal, but also not fully applied, they're equal. And this makes sense when you think about how SMT works. SMT equality is just congruence. It's just like if it knows that two terms are equal, then in any context, that's equal context, those will also be equal. Uh, so if you give this a look at Haskell, it'll check it and it'll accept it too. I'm not just showing you the same thing because you can see we worked a little bit harder. Right? So liquid Haskell is not just 110%. It gives way more uh, the hardest working program in show business. Okay. So great. Uh, Function finale. You're good to go. Like we proved, we proved the, the thing we set out to do. So that's great. I'm always excited when I've proved the thing that I set out to do. But you can prove. Yeah, you can prove other things. <laughs> Sorry, this is, this is uh, surfing uh, with uh, James, what, Parker? No, what's his name? James Parker. And uh, Patrick um, Redmond is not pictured, but he's like right over there somewhere. Uh, so it turns out you can, you, can, uh, you can prove some other things too. Yeah, it's like less good. It's like, yeah, this is about the wipeout. This is, yeah, this is, I mean, it's embarrassing, right? It's like not a thing you want your prover to produce. This is like not great. So let's, let's figure out why this happens. Why, why is this a thing that we can suddenly prove? Uh, so here's a proof of it. Uh, so we have the same definitions. Um, I've added uh, add two int. This is a more advanced function compared to add one int. It does more work. Um, I had to spend a little more time writing it. Uh, so um, I'm going to use that these functions to prove that uh, one is equal to two. How? Well, when applied to zero, add one int gives you one. Right? Everyone following along? Cool. Uh, when you apply add two int to zero, it gives you two. So you've mastered these complex functions already. Okay, good. And then functional intentionality does the rest. So uh, SMT is like, uh, you know, did a bit of a dipsy doodle. So like, let's let's see what let's see what happened. Like, why why is this why is this the thing that's going on? Um, okay, so here are the parts. So what what types did we infer for these? Because like, it's really going to come down to, to various like the types we get, and then the sub which will induce subtyping checks, and that's going to be what hands off to SMT. So let's see what happens. So here we'll get the selfified type of numbers that are equal to one. 
selfified type of numbers that are equal to two. This is just sort of the logical evaluation. This is just like the SMT solver knowing how the program ran. All right, the whole funx term is gonna be a proof that these two functions which are equal only on the input negative two are equal. Okay, well, when you call the add one nat when given negative two will return zero, and so we'll add two int. That's just the only time they're actually equal. Unnecessary detail. If you don't see that, really don't worry about it. You're probably not gonna see add one int, add one nat again, like outside of this talk. I don't think it's gonna come up. So if you don't have it mastered, don't feel bad. Okay, so, uh, so why is this a proof? Why is this a proof that these two things are equal? Like what, what went wrong here? And like this is awfully suspicious, right? My, the, the, the thing I'm handing off to functional extensionality that all these things are equal is just saying, oh no, no, yeah, you could figure that out SMT. It's like really not a big deal. Uh, and that's gonna have this type. And now we can kind of see what the problem is, right? The domain type is like arguably a little too strong. And like on the one hand, get it, right? Like I love, I love this for liquid Haskell, like this strength and power. Uh, it found the most general type. That's great, that's the kind of type that you want to infer. In a system with subtyping, you want the most general type. Um, it just happens that the domain type, because of contravariance, is, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's too low. It's the bottom type, right? It's given, the, given us the empty type. So it's certainly the case that, you know, on the empty domain, any function with the same skeleton type, the same simple type, is gonna be equal. So this is a, this is a bummer. Okay, so we need, um, we need like a different notion of equality. So we can like ask the type theorists, like what, what can we do? Like what's the, what's the right equality to set up? Uh, excuse me, before we, before we do that, let's figure out uh, what, what exactly went wrong here. So you might think, like I've said left as though liquid Haskell uh, is the thing that was in the wrong here, but I think liquid Haskell should stay strong. I think it's doing the exact right thing. So the problem has to be in our assumption, right? It's not that liquid Haskell is like badly unsound for this reason. It's, uh, it's that, Fun X here is not going to work for us. So I would say there's two problems. The first problem being that this A type here is sort of unconstrained. Right? It, really, we just need it to be sort of a subtype of the domain types that we're going to infer there, and that's not enough to know. And the next thing is that there's no memory of the type that we learned this equality at. Look, I'm fine agreeing that add one nat and add two int are equal on the empty domain, but I should only use that equality when talking about them at the empty domain. So we're gonna need something to sort of keep track of these types, and we need something to constrain the type of that A. So this is when we can ask the type theorist, please, can you supply for us some notion of equality uh, that will be useful? Okay, no, they got carried away. No, this is not, this is not, all right. Okay, so th these are the three core forms of equality we're gonna need to think about. Uh, so there's, there's SMT equality, we can't change this. This is sort of like structural, congruent equivalence relation. It's like the one you think about. It's the thick for first order data, it's the kind of the right choice. Cool. Then there's um, Haskell equality. And this is user definable, but like it should be following sort of the same, the same principles. No, there might be some non-structural parts here that's fine, it would be great to accommodate that. Uh, but in general, it's gonna be following the same sort of blueprint as the SMT equality. And then we're gonna have this propositional equality that we need to define, this new equality that's gonna have a type index and it's gonna be extensional and we're not gonna mess it up this time, is the plan. Okay, cool. Uh, so you might think that we're gonna define something that looks like one of these, right? These sort of Martin Luff style equalities that people also call Leibniz equality because they were proved to be equivalent. Um, and you could, and, and, and in fact we saw uh, Lee Kogros did something a little bit similar to this. Um, but uh, in general, this kind of definition is not gonna do the right thing for liquid Haskell in sort of a, like a, a, a long-term way. First, these are not extensional. This is just like not it. Um, and second, there's this other problem with like all of these languages, the three, th three of these languages have something in common that they have a notion of proposition. And liquid Haskell's notion of proposition was refinements of unit. It's really, it's just like not a thing. Uh, in part because of liquid Haskell being just gutter bumpers on a bowling alley that existed long before bowl, uh, liquid Haskell did itself. So, so like we have to we have to sort of stick to the Haskell, the Haskell world. So, so we're gonna need a slightly different solution. Okay, let me show you what that is. Uh, so there's actually gonna be four qualities, because like why not? Uh, so, so we'll have SMT equality that's fixed, we're stuck with it. We have a Haskell equality that's fixed, we're stuck with it. We're gonna do this index propositional equality, but I'm gonna split it into two parts. So there's peak, the propositional equality that's extensional and sort of has the general properties we want. But we don't want a direct interface from there to SMT equality or Haskell equality. 
we're gonna have axiomatized equality, a eek, as an intermediary, which characterizes those equalities that are sort of well behaved and can be sort of interfaced with SMT. Because like I said, SMT cannot be relied upon to treat equalities between functions correctly. So we have to keep it all separate. Uh, this a eek serves other purposes that I'll talk about a little bit uh, at the very, very end of the talk. So how do these work? Uh, here is a eek, the axiomatic equality. So there's a couple of things to sort of piece apart here that sort of is like liquid Haskell inside baseball sort of jargon. So first, bb eek, a measure, is a way, among other things, of defining an uninterpreted SMT function. We're going to export, we're going to ship off to SMT facts about this equality, but we don't want to ship them as raw SMT equalities by default. Right? We need to keep these, these, these notions separate because we don't want to start saying that functions are equal and then proving that one equals two. Okay, so with that measure, we'll define a couple of things. First, b eek, this is the same as double equals notionally. It's not going to be necessarily exactly the same, but uh, this is just a, the reflection of that measure, and this is your decidable equality, computational equality. And then, uh, because it's liquid Haskell, we can bring along some, some nice things, the same way that type classes in, in Cock or other languages uh, with propositions let you have proofs with them, we can do the same. So for example, uh, your axiomatic equality needs to be an equivalence relation, and you must supply the proofs for that uh, for us to accept your instance. And then it also has to imply SMT equality, so that we can safely ship off any equality you know about in axiomatic equality. So this is sort of a wrapper, a shim, around Haskell equality. With that, we can define our extensional propositional equality. Um, so uh, this uses effectively the same trick of like, oh gosh, we're gonna we're gonna have sort of a carrier type here called equality prop, that is like the actual Haskell type that carries this, but there's no content, right? The proof is REFL, but there's no index. It's just yeah, yeah, it's they're equal. So all of the action here is going to be in the um, in the refinements. Uh, there's three ways to prove equalities in this propositional equality, uh, where, where I'll show you them in a moment, but uh, let's look at number two. First, we have to define the Haskell types that sort of characterize this propositional equality and define the uninterpreted symbol. That's the measure again, so we define those. Now we can look at the, uh, the actual constructors, if you will. They're not constructors you can do case on, right? There's no, there's no point. I don't know why you would ever allow somebody to see which of these was used to prove inequality. Um, they're, just, they're just there. So first, uh, if you have a proof in axiomatic equality, that's a proof in propositional equality. That's basic. So, so we're just sort of including all of those equalities by default. These are the obvious first order equalities. Uh, for extensionality, well, we just we state our, our theorem, but there's a couple of uh, important changes here now. One, we have the type index on peak, right? The final return type there of A, R, B. And now this, this will be enough to force uh, uh, a correct typing of A as well. So now we've, we've tracked the type and we, uh, we um, have forced A to get inferred at a sensible type. There's one third constructor after these first two, which are sort of the obvious ones you might want. Uh, and that's, uh, we call it substitutability. This is sort of making sure that this is a congruence. So for our notion of context, we'll just take an arbitrary function f and say that if things are considered equal, then uh, giving them to a function should give you equal results, propositionally speaking. And this is something we have to sort of assume and, and fix because we're not going to get congruence for free from SMT because this is not equality in SMT's eyes. This is a different, a different notion. Cool. So there's, um, there's some related work. You should check out the paper that talks about this, uh, uh, like in the, um, the homotopy type theory world, like XTT in particular as a system does something a little similar to this. Uh, but again, they're, they're working in a, in a type theory, right? Our, our core stratum is sort of in like the simply typed discipline. So we, we can't use their tricks. Sort of all the fancy type theory stuff doesn't exactly pour over uh, the way you might hope it would. So in the paper, we, uh, we build a small core model. Uh, we uh, define a logical relation over it and use that to prove a couple of nice theorems that this propositional equality is well behaved. So first, the logical relation itself is an equivalence. Okay, cool, I should hope so. Um, then p is an equivalence. Okay, good, so we've actually defined an equivalence relation. You'll notice I don't have here a proof of substitutability. That would be nice, but we don't have it. Uh, to do that, uh, so the sort of this closure property showing not just that your logical relation is included in contextual equivalence, but vice versa, is a lot of work, it turns out. Um, and it just didn't feel worth it to us. Uh, could be cool to do, I don't know. Uh, the proof that, an, that it's an equivalence are neat. They, um, they're, they're pretty standard proofs. There's something cool about our work here, too, that I, I particularly enjoyed, uh, which is that we were able to do these proofs in liquid Haskell itself as well, in addition to doing them on paper. Uh, and that might be surprising if you look at the text here, because these proofs go by induction on the type. 
Uh, now, doing induction on a term on data in liquid Haskell is very easy. That's recursion, right? This is this, this straightforward duality. But uh, the type? So there's a technique. We didn't invent it. Uh, we sort of rediscovered it. So far as I can tell, it doesn't have a name, so I took the opportunity to give it a fun name. Uh, I've been calling it classy induction. We have been calling it. So you have some property you want to prove over all types. You want to do induction on types, you want to prove it over all types. You define a type class for that property, and you say the property you want. So here, we're going to do reflexivity. Right? Every, every term is propositionally equal to itself. So the type class says, hey, here's this property that you could have for a type. And now we're going to do induction. OK, our base case is the axiomatic equalities. These are the first order, the scalar values, the low, the low level structures. And this is actually, this is very easy because we've required that the axiomatic equality be reflective. So that's solid. Okay, and then for function types, you define a blanket instance. And we're, you can see the induction hypothesis we're using on the codomain. We don't need to bother on the domain because there's only one input we're actually looking at. And this defines REFL. So now if you put the reflexivity A constraint somewhere, the constraint solver in GHC will do induction for you and find the concrete solution. Now, if you had, say, a fancy data type that you want to do this for, okay, you would have to define an instance. You could define blanket instances using uh, generics and then do a deriving reflexivity if you were that kind of person. Uh, and I thought this was really neat. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a whole section uh, in the related work where we talk about other people who have done this. It's not at all a new technique. It goes back, I would guess, about 20 years. I don't remember the exact first origin of it, but it's definitely an old technique. Um, but I think giving it a name is nice because it lets you say, I'm like, here's a way to do this. So hopefully uh, other people will, will do this and check this out. I found it to be very, very powerful and neat. It's like cool to get some system guarantees from inside the system. Um, how much time do I have left, just out of curiosity? Uh, two minutes. Great. Uh, yeah. Chill. Sounds great. Thanks. OK, so uh, I want to round this out by talking a little bit about um, the programs you can prove. So first off, it's like super, the goal I set was very reasonable, arguably too reasonable up front. It's sort of like very easy thing uh, to prove. Uh, so it's just like very straightforward, right? You can prove that these things are equal using extensionality. Uh, sorry for the name change. Um, uh, and then substitutability, it's like well, the fact that it's in maps, it's like, well, yeah, maps a context. You just do it. Sick. So this is sort of like, this is the training wheels extensionality stuff. Like you don't actually, like in most contexts, you don't need this. It's just like nice to have. The, the places you need it are for when you start to have higher order representations, right? The oops all lambdas. <coughs> Uh, so here is the associativity law for um, endofunctors as a monoid. Uh, and this is a proof done in the sort of rewriting style. So this uh, equals tilde equals is like, so we've, we've seen now what, uh, in Lee Korgas' talk we saw triple equals, meaning that they're equal, and then equal hash equal, meaning that they're equal in the step indexed way. And this one uh, actually says, I actually don't care how they're related. <laughs> It's just, it's just, it's the same as question mark, but it looks nice. Uh, and what this does is it lets us give this sort of rewriting style. Right? We, we would, couldn't write equal there because then SMT would insist that they were actually equal. But these are function values. Like, what does it mean for them to be equal to SMT? You'd be, you, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. All right, so, uh, so we just, this is just a nice way to write it. But then um, a thing I want to notice here, we're using these type classes. Right, so, so the way the proof works is you start with reflexivity and then you do some rewriting to see like, oh, from this equality to itself, all of these are sort of witnessable steps by the logical evaluation that happens in SMT uh, and it all sort of works out. This is kind of nice, like you can write these proofs this way. Uh, you can write really long proofs this way. So this is the associativity law for, um, oh, excuse me, the composition law for the applicative instance for readers. Uh, the comment at the very top of it, I'm sure it's impossible for you to read, says, whew, this one takes a long time. <laughs> it does. Uh, so if you, if you zoom in, you can see this is like a series of transitive steps that are doing the rewrites that you would do if you were going to have like a paper proof of the equivalence of these, right, in like using Haskell's referential transparency, like if you were going to write it that way. So that's nice in that it's sort of, uh, you know, the way the language works. It's, there's, there are less nice aspects of this in that this is a tremendous amount of code to write. Like it would be cool if there were like, I don't know, some kind of like proof macro system or something like that that could like help, like help simplify that so that you could, didn't have to generate this all yourself, some kind of tactics or maybe we'll hear about it later. Okay. Um, so to wrap up, uh, what have we done today? We've sort of started to piece apart the way that equality works in liquid Haskell. Uh, 
by breaking it up into this propositional equality that lets us deal with function values, which feels key for such a higher order language, but also by starting to think a little more clearly about what we mean by equality and how that interfaces with SMT. Um, and I think this is sort of really kind of just the first step in towards a much sounder treatment of custom instances and the custom meanings of programs. So this sort of like is a, I think sort of a soundness hole in liquid Haskell's. It makes assumptions about how your programs are gonna behave here and starting to make this a little bit more rigorous and placing appropriate requirements on the instances uh, will be sort of a key step towards like uh, improved apply, ap applicability of liquid ha Haskell. Um, I think that there's like totally worthwhile future work to do around like soundness for substitutability. Um, uh, I frankly, uh, I think it would be cool to know. I also frankly don't care. Like I don't, I don't know what the value of proving that lemma would be. Uh, but uh, it certainly is a hard lemma to prove and uh, sometimes hard things are worth it uh, on their own. Uh, anyway, uh, if you wanted to play with this, this is just something you can Cabal install. And if you wanted to do some proofs about your higher order representations, you can just like go and get this uh, and just use the library. You just, uh, you can import our combinators uh, and our notion of propositional equality and just use it. Uh, if you have any bugs, uh, let Nikki know. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to, to hear your questions. Thanks so much. Any questions from the audience uh, in the back? Thanks. So um, I, I was wondering, when you added this functional extensionality assumption, um, the initial one was unsound because you could derive, well, false. Hmm. Um, and while I, I don't understand exactly uh, still how it works, but I feel like it is because you proved equality um, of a subtype of those functions, and then you declare that the, that the whole functions are equal, hmm. and that derives the unsoundness. So is this only a thing that happens for functions or are there also other uh, axioms that users might want to add where you have the same kind of unfortunate generalization that happens? Yeah, so we talk about this a little bit in the paper. There's a long derivation of, uh, of sort of why this is a problem and explaining the type, the type uh, inference constraints that lead to this being wrong. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a whole family of axioms basically where unconstrained type variables or unconstrained variables in the domains of higher order functions will be, be abused. Uh, so a fun anecdote is in one of the rejections of this paper, uh, someone proposed an alternative uh, to functional extensionality saying, this one looks like it would work and of course had the exact same bug. The same review also indicated that our solution was too simple. So yeah, I don't know, I don't know. There's like, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole um, family of such bad functions. Um, I think in current liquid Haskell, it gives you a warning when you have derived false in your SMT context. Uh, which is a pretty good code smell that something has gone horribly <laughs> wrong. Uh, but I, I'm sure that's not foolproof. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, part of why we wanted to write the paper is that uh, this was a, a bug that got noticed sort of independently in Liquid Haskell and in searching the literature, we found nothing. The F star documentation that led to their uh, sort of squashed propositional equality that's a true proposition um, uh, is documented only in a chat transcript in a GitHub issue. So we thought it would be worth talking about this in more detail. But yeah, it's a serious, it's a serious issue with I think any inferred refinement type system that it's very easy for the types to get out of hand. Sorry. Uh, so the the the, spe the questioner asked re asked. Uh, so is it I, I referenced high order functions again? Is it really only a problem for them? And yes, it's only a problem there because the only time so finding a most general type will find you types that are that are more general. Unless you're in a negative position because of contravariance, you'll find types that are most specific. So it's it's exactly a problem with negative positions. If you had some other like not higher order but some other contravariant position in a data type. Uh, I don't know if that's even possible to do in Liquid. Okay, you can in Liquid Haskell do that. Then those positions also would be dangerous positions uh, for type inference. Amazing, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Okay, so a more simple thing to do, which is probably wrong, hmm. um, would be that uh, the problem arises that because you have this function which is used diff differently and then the kind of constraint boils down to saying that they're equal on an empty domain, which mm. is kind of holds trivially. So another thing which you could imagine doing is saying that um, if the function always agrees on the, the first components, the, the, the non-refined types, um, then they're equal. 
Would that work or would that be not strong enough or something? So that wouldn't, that wouldn't let you prove the equality I wanted, which is that these two are equal on naturals. Hmm. Right, because the behavior is genuinely different. Uh, so in this example, it's a little contrived, right? Yeah. Add one int, add one, add one nat are not the most advanced programs people have written in right, Haskell. Right, right. Uh, but I think they're sort of emblematic of the kinds of differences between specifications and actual um, implementations that you might see in the real world. So you might have just like a, outside of your domain, the nice specification might signal a lovely error message, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the actual implementation probably just does something batshit. Okay. Um. One last question, uh, maybe up there, Kos. Uh, there. Uh, you mentioned that some SMT solvers validate function extensionality. Mm. Uh, if you use such a solver to back your refinement types, does that allow you to prove false? That's a good question, and I have not tried it. I don't. I don't know. Um, you would still have the same problem with type inference that we have here and that the, the constraints, like before the, the constraints even get to the SMT solver, Liquid Haskell has decided that the domain will be false. So it will it will supply bad constraints and the solver will happily uh, do proofs that are um, nonsense. Um, uh, if, if you fixed that, you might, for example, if you were guaranteed you were using a solver that knew about extensionality, then you would need to be maybe a little less careful than we are about the AEC, PEEC distinction. Uh, and maybe you could ship off more interesting equalities and the solver could do a little more for you, uh, which would save you some trouble writing extensionality. But now you've written a liquid Haskell program that only worked with some solvers, which strikes me as a pretty bad call. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Michael again.